Sophie Lund Rockcliffe. I'm Sophie Lund Rockcliffe, and I have a job in the Divinity Faculty in Cambridge. Um, I'm a lecturer in patristics, which is a rather strange way of talking about early church history. And um, before I arrived at Cambridge, I taught for ten years in a classics department in another university. And before that, I taught medieval history at the University of Cambridge. Um, and that's all a way of saying that I've actually been interested in the devil for about twenty years. <laughs> But I've been used to studying and teaching the subject in three very different sorts of departments. And one of the topics that we want to sort of get you thinking about today is the canon. So what is it that we read and study and what gets into it and what's left out? And I wanted to start off by asking the question of where is the devil in the canon of Christian theology and history? Um, and there are two big things to say about that. First of all, on the margins. So for example, you look at the history of statements of belief, Christian creeds, you won't find much about Satan there. If you look at the history of the discussion of doctrine of theology at church councils, not much Satan there. And if you look at major works of systematic theology, which are still studied by um, theologians in the 21st century, you won't find much devil there either. But, if you look at the enormous range of different sorts of texts produced in the uh, late, late antique, early medieval church, so the church of the first millennium, so the first 1200 years of its existence, the devil is everywhere. And this is why I've been so fascinated by this topic for so long, which is it's something that seems to not be embraced by the institutional church. Um, and yet it's so important to the lives and the beliefs and indeed the habits and thoughts and actions of ordinary Christians. Um, so what I want to do today is just to give you a little introduction to some of the, the interesting places where you can find the devil and not just sort of ideas about the devil, statements about the devil, but also the devil speaking. And what we'll see is that the devil gets, well, the devil gets some quite good lines, but also that the devil is good to think with. So lots of our writers in the first 1200 years of the church use the devil to get across particular messages. Um, and I also want to think about texts, not just as things that are stories, that are narratives, that contain speeches, but also as texts that can do things in the world. So the idea of text as being lively and indeed even powerful. And I'm going to end with quite, I hope, a good example of that. So lots of different sorts of text. I'm going to focus on two different sorts of genre today. The first is hymns. Um, hymns are things that are invented quite early in the history of the church. And they're written on a range of topics, stories from the Bible, topics from theology, um, and they're written to be performed. This is probably the most important thing about them. They're written to be sung. They're things which involve a congregation. So they're not just things that you sit and listen to, they're things that you join in with. Um, and they're things that actually begin in the very Eastern half of the Roman Empire. And in fact, beyond the borders of the Roman Empire in the Persian Empire. So some of the earliest Christian hymns we have are actually written um, in uh, Syriac, which is a Semitic language. And we have lots of hymns that get written eventually in Greek and Latin as well. And what's extraordinary about the body of early Christian hymns is lots of them give the devil very lengthy direct speeches, um, which are often quite funny, um, quite grotesque, full of dramatic irony. The devil thinks he knows everything, but often makes some really terrible mistakes. And it raises really interesting questions about how a congregation sitting in a church, standing up to sing this hymn, were meant to think about Satan when they were busy singing his very words. So I've got a couple of examples I wanted to show you. Um, and the first comes from this fourth century writer called Ephraim. Um, and this is part of a lengthy series of hymns in which Satan debates with other figures like death and sin. Um, and in this hymn, there's a little passage I've put on your slide here, in which Satan talks about how he operates. He talks about um, binding men with sloth and drawing away their senses from all good things, their eyes from reading, their mouths from singing praise, their understanding from doctrine. So Satan is basically at work trying to distract people from the work of holiness, from being good, from being attentive, indeed from sitting in church um, he's distracting them from singing praise, so he's distracting them from singing hymns. Um, he's distracting them from reading, perhaps reading scripture, 
He's distracting them from understanding doctrine, from thinking about theology. So Satan is actually boasting about all the stuff he's distracting humans from doing in precisely the space where they're supposed to be doing those things. Um, and then the congregation joins in with a refrain saying, blessed is he, referring to Jesus, who came and laid bare the wiles of the crafty one. So even though the main bits of the verse of this hymn have a single singer voicing Satan, the refrain provides the congregation with an opportunity to kind of join in and sort of beat down the devil. Um, and it does raise the question about what it might have felt like to have been standing up in church and singing the words of Satan, where everyone around you is joined, if you like, um, in hatred of this spiritual creature in which belief is very, very strong. Um, and that you're, in a sense, taking on the persona of that individual. And this is a tradition which spreads very widely across the Roman Empire. So just one more example of this um, would be from a hymn composed in the sixth century in Greek in Constantinople, which is modern Istanbul, by a very famous um, poet called Romanos. And here you get something similar, but even more perhaps grotesque. We've got a little description of the devil watching what's going on um, during the um, events of the Passion and the Crucifixion and recognising to his horror that the thing that he had dreaded most of all, that this Jesus is actually a very powerful person, and in fact he's discovering is the Son of God, um, is, is coming to pass. And so you've got a little lament where he starts wailing and crying to his friends, saying, what shall I do with this troublesome Jesus with the son of Mary who is killing me? And then the congregation joins in and finishes off his sentence. So here we have an instance where the words of Satan are being sung by a cantor, and then the congregation join in. So they themselves as a collective actually take on the voice of the individual evil one. Now, I think what's going on in these hymns is not just the retelling of stories, it's not just the retelling of the story of the conquest of the powers of evil by Jesus. It's also an opportunity for congregations to gang up together and try and beat up Satan. And we know that in part because some of these texts include little commentaries which tell you that Satan was wounded by the songs that he heard sung. Um, and this is in line with, again, another huge body of literature from um, the late antique and early medieval periods, which is magical literature, in which texts are composed in which Satan and demons are directly attacked, often using stories from the Bible or prayers that are lifted from biblical language. Um, and so there is a continuum, if you like, in which the hymns that you sing in church in this period are sort of connected to the kind of magical literature in which you are trying to smash up Satan. Okay, so that's one genre. The second genre I want to talk about is actually that of hagiography, which is just a sort of fancy way of talking about lives of the saints. And this is a genre of life writing which emerges in the early church out of the habit of writing about the lives of particular kinds of Christians, those who've died for their faith, so martyrs in the second and third centuries. And it sort of diversifies into writing the lives of other kinds of people who are particularly holy especially ascetics, so people who have relinquished a kind of ordinary worldly life to live a life of extreme self-deprivation and seclusion. Um, and you'll find that in these stories, the devil also features very heavily as the direct opponent of the holy person and is also often given lengthy portions of speech. So I'm going to give you two examples. Um, the first one is from a very, very famous, probably the most famous life of a saint written in antiquity, which is the life of Antony who is a desert monk who goes um, to live this life of great sort of self-denial in the Egyptian desert. And the story about his life um, contains actually a little bit of first person narration by Antony of his experiences in the desert. So this is actually Antony himself speaking. And this is a story about being visited in the desert by a very, very big, tall, strange figure who went Anthony asks him who he is, he says, I am Satan. And Anthony asks, well, why are you here? And Satan answered, why do the monks and all other Christians blame me undeservedly? Why do they curse me hourly? 
And Anthony answered, why do you trouble them? And he said, I'm not he who troubles them, they trouble themselves, I've become weak. I have no longer a place, a weapon, a city. The Christians are spread everywhere and at length, even the desert is filled with monks. So again, you've got this rather pitiful figure of a Satan who's been pushed out of the one space which his has left to him, which is the desert, um, and is full of sort of rancor towards the monks who've taken over his special sort of dwelling space, um, and is upset by the fact that they are cursing him. So again, nested within a narrative about Satan, we've got very lively interchange between a human and the devil, um, in which you also find references to this idea that the way that you talk about someone has an effect on them. So the monks cursing Satan are hurting him. Um, and again, we have this kind of magical, I think, dimension to these sorts of texts. And I want to take that even further with my last example, um, which actually takes us to um, the picture that was used to advertise this talk. Now we're cycling on a good sort of 600 years here. So just imagine the chronological leap um, into Anglo-Norman England. Um, and this amazing image actually comes from the Library of St. Catherine's College in Cambridge. It comes from a manuscript of um, the life of St. Margaret of Antioch, who is a saint of the sort of second or third century CE. Very, very popular in the Middle Ages. Um, and this um, little framed image here shows one of the climactic moments of the life of Margaret in which she meets, um, well, first of all, she meets a dragon who swallows her up and she ends up sort of busting her way out of its belly. And then she meets the devil with whom she has a conversation. And here you've got the two figures have been kind of conflated. So you've got a sort of a beast with the tail of a dragon. And Margaret has quite a lengthy interchange with the devil in which she asks him basically what he's up to and how what, what he's doing. And I put a passage on this slide in which the devil starts off and you can sort of get again a flavor of the comic um, quality of this by saying, um, I'll, I'll gladly tell you what you want to know, but your foot, which you have on my head, can you just raise it a bit so I can breathe a little? And so Margaret very generously sort of lets go of his neck and he sort of coughs and says, Beelzebub is my name. I do nothing other than fight against the people of this world. I am the one who constantly does battle against good men. I cloud their eyes and their wits. I make them forget their wisdom. Now you can actually see, and this was not contrived at all. This is almost accidental, that there is a continuity between the very first text we looked at in which Ephraim's devil boasts about distracting people from virtue and indeed from their kind of thinking processes. He clouds their eyes and their wits, makes them forget their wisdom. And he laments, woe is me, wretched unhappy one. Again, the sort of pitiful sort of spectacle of the arch sort of um, fiend of evil actually sort of confessing defeat. Um, and it's particularly shameful for him in interestingly gendered terms in this text because he's been overcome not just by a holy Christian person, but specifically by a woman, a virgin, a young girl. If a man of worth had defeated me, he said, it would be much less shameful for me. There's no equal battle in you know, 12th, 11th, 12th century England, being defeated by a woman is much, much worse than being defeated by a man. Um, now, so far so good, we've got some idea of a kind of a narrative with a back and forth between sort of sassy Margaret and the devil. But there's more to this text than meets the eye because as well as being a story about an archetypal encounter in which Satan gets to say his piece, it's also a story which was put to use. So the last thing I'm going to show you is a little extract from a prayer that Margaret makes in this text where she says, here are all the people who can call upon me and among those are women in labor. He says, if a woman's in labor and calls upon me in her hour of need, give them help and preserve both their lives, talking about the woman and her child. And we know that this is a text that was actually used as a kind of magical object by pregnant and laboring women. Um, and in some manuscripts, the prayer actually includes a supplementary instruction about how to use the book. So having a copy of this book, you can sign yourself with the sign of the cross with a copy of it, or you just look in it, or indeed you place it on yourself, or perhaps listen to a passage being read. And that will have a transformative effect on your pregnancy and on your labor. So again, my point about text being powerful things that aren't just contain stories, but are things that are thought to do things in the world, seems to me exemplified by this text in particular.